The story of the city of Belfast and how it came to be is really the story of East Belfast because it was in the east that a village became a townland and that townland and the rivers that ran through it gave birth to a mighty industrial engine. It was the engine of East Belfast that was to put the city and Northern Ireland on the map worldwide in terms of industrial innovation and unrivaled engineering skill. Billy McCart didn't become part of Belfast until 1853 in the first revision of the boundary. So at that time it was, as I say, just a, a, a rural townland. And this can be seen on the Williamson map of 1791. Benjamin Edwards Glassworks, which he established in 1776, was one of the early uh, sources of employment. Uh, later, John Smiley started another glassworks to make window glass, specialised in window glass. Uh, but this failed before the end of the century and Edwards took it over. And uh, glassworks, or glass making, continued until the uh, 1860s under various owners. And the last owner was William Adolphus Ross, who became known for his mineral waters. Uh, at Lagan Village was another centre of industry at that period. Uh, and you can see uh, the earthenware pottery of Victor Coates. He later took over the Lagan foundry on this site. He, was the, uh, he built the first iron ship on the Lagan in 1838. And he went on to become the leading manufacturer of steam engines. So the only other industry shown on Williamson's map is the, the new rope walk. Now, the, this rope walk uh, closed at a later stage, but rope making remained a, a very uh, prominent industry in East Belfast until late 20th century. The First World War, the first modern war, robbed the nation of not only its finest sons, but of its innocence too. Yet in the maze of narrow streets which made up East Belfast, the mindset remained that of a village, where people relied on one another just to get by. Try and give us a flavour of what life was like in East Belfast in those days, obviously a very tight-knit community. Oh, why? Well, you knew who lived beside you. Today I don't think people realise that people Living beside them, never mind their name. Oh, you knew who they were, and you knew their Uncle Joe and all the rest of it. Like, uh, everybody knew one another, and everybody worked for each other, which was maybe more important. If there was anyone sick, very often you'd have seen somebody running over with a wee plate with maybe a, a cloth or it was a meal for somebody. Like, you wouldn't see that today. You blame the government for not having that service. Those days, the government wasn't thought of. Any time you thought of the government was when the elections were on. I didn't like school. I was all, I could have stayed up any time. Although I did well, I was always nervous answering the questions. And I loved it, like, like the school, like the teachers and all, you know. I used to carry on. I used to get told off for carrying on so much, you know. But I enjoyed it. Tell me a bit about community in those days. What was it like living in those wee streets? It was all right, just everybody was in harmony. There was no... Everybody helped one another, you know. And you knew all your neighbours? Yes, my gran lived two doors from us. You started working, um, packing up linen products? Uh, linen products, pill slips and all that, uh, yeah. And would that, would that have been like an eight-hour day, or what, what was your working day like? Nine o'clock, I think, was the word we started, and then you worked to, to six. You got an hour for your lunch. And was that not a, a shock to your system, being just 14 years of age? Uh-huh. Was it, were you not very tired? No, I never, never felt tired, no. You were glad to be out of school glad and earning money? Glad to be out of school and at, at work, thought it was great working, you know. So what age were you when you left school then? 14, happy enough. And did you know what you wanted to be at that stage or what you wanted to do? 
Uh, well, no, that's, that's the only problem. Most people had a good idea what they would have liked to have done. But don't forget, those were about the 1930s, and if it was a job, you went to it. And if you're lucky enough, it was your job, the one you wanted, you were quids in. But in the meantime, people were looking for a wage. Hunger was a, something that was known, and there was some very hard cases. Was that because of the aftermath of the First World War? I would say it was the aftermath of the First World War. Like it was a depression, depression years. When, when, when you say there was hunger, I mean, did you feel that yourself? That you no, didn't? I didn't feel that because my father had plots or allotments, whatever you call them, whatever you like, and he was industrious that way. And uh, well, we always had a good supply of vegetables, and we were able to hand over some spuds to the people who or maybe having it a wee bit rough. And I, I can remember in around Cromwell Square, five houses and one toilet. Like that's... And it was probably an outside toilet? It was an outside toilet. Oh, <laughs> don't know why they call them privies. <laughs> we need to key up, like. <laughs> I'm sure people nowadays, young people, Probably couldn't even comprehend that, that they didn't have a, a house and a toilet in your house. My grandchildren think I'm joking. When I tell them about some of the, some of the way, way people live, like, like, not just one house, but like a row of houses. And that was it. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you wouldn't want back to those days. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. One of the earliest and most iconic East Belfast industries was the manufacture of rope, in great demand from shipbuilders like Harland and Wolfe and shipping lines across the world. As a kid going into it, it was very strange. And what I had to do we had a, a, what they call a, a bogey. It was like a, a built up cart. And there were all rooms divided in different places. One was the roving room, the other was a spinning room, or was a carding room, and a couple of other rooms. There was big machines. And the wheeled bobbins in from one room to the other. First of all, the, the, they brought it in the garage and they, they put it on a machine and they we, weaved part part of the, the the cord and then the bobbins were on other machines and there was about five or six or seven or eight girls, young girls, and they would have put these what they called bobbins on these spirals, and when I got them all on, they the, would the, 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 the twine on these bobbins, and when they were filled, they took them off and put them and transferred them, and that's the way from one, and that there went from one room to another room to sort of do something else with them. But we were only concerned with one part of our, our room. I think it was about 16 or 17, and the sister working at work and I wanted in too, so I got in beside her, which was hard work, it was different. Uh, you got 10 frames to mine, 10, and the bobbins were on the plane, on the thing, and you got the con at the end, and your twine went up. First you start as a wee twi uh, girl doing the, wheeling the cons up to all the frames. That was your first start. And then you got up a bit and you're able to Put the learn how to do the, the machinery. It was a hard machinery, but we got through it. You got ten frames to mine. It was like a straw thing, you know, but there was a lot of it together, and you put, put, pushed it through, and I was dotting the cord on the, the bomb, and then round. Get a cap going up. You had to keep feeding it if it's all coming near the end, you know, so, and it made the twine and all. And what, what, what were the shifts like in those days? How many hours did you do? 
We started at 8 o'clock in the morning and you got from 12 to 1 for your lunch. And you were back to 6 o'clock. You had to work on Saturday morning too from 8 to 12. So that was quite, quite a physical job big then? Big job. Rope work was a big place, very big place. They were all different rooms, you know. Would it have been hundreds of people then? Or? Well, there would have been, yes, yes, yes. My father oiled what they called Stafford's. If I can remember Stafford's. And my father oiled those. And my nose run dry. We girls were shouting, oh, get the wee Stafford man. Then I said, oh, here's wee Stuffer coming, you know what, from one word to the other. Here's Stuffer now. And they called him Stuffer Cain. And I was called, there was four, four bo five, of, five boys all together at home. And I was the only one that was called Stuffer because they called me James. And I was called after my father, so they called me Stuffer Cain. And all through my life, it has been Stuffer Cain. Nobody knows me as James. The skyline of East Belfast was, and still is, dominated by two famous yellow cranes, the mighty Samson and Goliath of the Harland and Wolf shipyard. Shipyard work was hard and dangerous, but it fed and watered Belfast families for generations. At its peak, Tens of thousands worked for the East's most iconic employer. Oh, the shipyard was great. When I went into the shipyard there, I went in as a boy. You, you would have been, what, 15, 16? Fifth, just, I would say 15, because I think I started at 14. Came out of school and started at the 14, the shipyard, or uh, rope works. Then I went into the shipyard and my next door neighbour, he was a plater. He got me in as his marker boy. My brother James, he was a welder. And uh, uh, Ronnie was a temporary light man. And uh, big Davy Humphreys, that's my brother-in-law, he was a shipwright. They were all shipyard men. And my father was a head phone man, electrician, down in the shipyard for all those years. And then the, 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 the war was coming on. And so he, he turned around and they said they were looking for some welders. So my father, he turned around and he says, could I put my son's name in? And so they took me on as a welder. And I was a welder till I come out. Worked at a punch one time. And, and my, my hand slipped, the plate caught in between the... And it, it, it squashed it. And I thought it was sore, but it, I mean... Then I said they were going to take it off. And I thought, what, what? what? And they put me out to take it off. And, but those things happen in the shipyard. And then I had a mate, John Dowling. He was walking at this, working at this, I was, uh, he was working at the side of the dock. And I was in through the shell of the boat just inside. And somebody said to me, John fell. And I ran out. And John went up a ladder. He was going up a ladder, like I'm saying this, and the ladder only came like that. It started that there. So as he got up and turned around, well, I sat in that ladder, and I wouldn't move. And they were going to put a new ladder up. This is the kind of things that they would have done. Well, I went out to the jetty, and there was ladders down to the side of the jetty for the workmen to go in below and, and keep it clean. And you, you, we had a went down there and it was all built sort of big four inch beams right across. It was all water in below. And we had a went down there and fished, made a hook and tried to get the fish or car to get the crabs. <laughs> we things like that, you know, that, that they'd come in the main. When the summer come in, but when I'm naked, there's no bathing costumes or anything like that. And when the boats were going by, I was swimming and yelling and shouting at the, you know. Well, it sounds more like a holiday camp than a factory or the... Well, you, uh, uh, to us it was a holiday camp. But don't get me wrong when I say this. Was, the work was done. No matter what time you done it at, uh, it was done. Because you couldn't, you couldn't not do it. Because all these boots had to be out at a certain time, you know, and 
it, it was great to see them getting built up. Belfast Engineering Companies played key roles in shipbuilding, aircraft manufacture and munitions production during World War II and it was the war which put women on an equal footing with men in terms of factory jobs. So Irene, you worked in Short and Harlands in East Belfast during the war. Yeah. That was the factory that at that time was working at munitions, it was building Stirling bombers. Give us an idea of the scale of, of, of the place in those days. Well, it was massive, it was huge, it really was. Did you feel under threat there then? No, I didn't, not in the least, no. I, I, because obviously parts of Belfast were bombed. Yes, now, Short and Harlands was, uh, on the, uh, Sunday night, uh, the Tuesday big night blitz here, it, it, we were all right, but on the Sunday night, Short and Harlands, the factory part of it got bombed a bit, you know. The officers were all right. And all along the Hollywood Road, they had smoke screens, and the smoke used to go, they used to really choke you. But it was more or less to, so that if the Germans did come over, all they saw was smoke, they couldn't see any land or anything like that. We're on a ship. And all of a sudden, the sirens went. And so all, we all had to come off the ship, off the ship. And the only place we could get into was down on the main road there, at the, on, down there, going down the shipyard. I just don't know the name of it. And uh, the big, what do you call it, the, there was a big joiner shop, it used to be. But they turned it into doing things for aeroplanes and stuff like that there, you see? Well, all of a sudden, the sirens, they, they had blown, and we all were getting in out of the road. And here, the, these people were put out of the, the big, big place, and we're all in different places hiding from this thing that was going on. But all of a sudden, the sirens went that way, they all clear. So the next thing was, it was a parachute bomb, and it was on its way down, and it fell right into the middle of that big shop I was telling you about, that where they made the aircraft, and it blew it asunder. And we were all down, nearly beside it, and they shouted at us, would you go in there and see if you could get anybody and see what's wrong? You got anybody at all to get them in, so as to be helpful. And when we went in, we could hardly walk on the floor because there were those wee, wee, wee uh, wooden block business and they, the water had got in below them and they were going like that and you couldn't have walked. But there wasn't a man alive in that place. They were all killed and that was in the aircraft, what we had called a joiner shop. And I'm, I, I was there during that time. I mean, you, you'd have still been a very young man then, so that would have been... Oh, I was young. I was young A pretty then. horrific thing to go through. Yes, yes. Just, I was young. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been 16 then. How did you keep in touch with people in those days? I mean... Well, oh, just wrote letters. And uh, some of them were microfilmed. Though you got them on a wee tiny envelope like that and wee, wee tiny print. And they used to have some type, something scored out of them if she'd written anything. You know, we were so and so and so and so, and she would describe where she was, and they would take all that out, so just he, in case it went into the wrong hands, I suppose. He, and even though you were, well, you weren't military personnel, though your no. father was, obviously, but your so you, your letters were censored as well. They were. We, everybody, more or less, was censored. Right, even the ordinary members of the Every public. Members, uh huh. I just at random, more or less. Yeah. You know. What about after the war? I mean, were there stringent things like rationing and yeah, stuff so like that? Yes, it was rationing right up to 1954. What was that like, living in that? It never bothered me an awful lot, because in those days, I honestly think Lord Walton or whoever he was in those days, I think he made sure that we got what we needed, you know? And I think that's why we're so strong today and lived so long, because we got the right food. I mean, it was definitely rationed, there's no doubt about that. You had no luxuries. And you got coupons there for sweets. You only got once a month. Whereas now, look at the, you can eat what you want, when you want, how you want. But um, I must admit, it didn't bother me at all. So you mean you didn't feel hard done by because you didn't know no, any different anyway? I didn't know any, no, I didn't feel hard done by at all. 
And what about your clothes and things like that? I mean, even even Yes, they were rationed, rationed too. You only got 18 coupons more or less to do your year. And like there was two, if you wanted a pair of nylons or stockings, as they were called in those days, you had to pay two and five or seven for a pair of shoes. And if you wanted a coat, it was 18, it took all your coupons, you know, nothing for anybody else. And that's where the black market came in. You used to buy coupons. There's plenty of soup and stew and everything in them days. And <laughs> you had to take it or leave it. I, I had a brother, he said to my mother, my mother, he says, I love uh, Brussels spouts, I got them, give them my ear. So I had to pay them on them till he died. <laughs> That's the way it was. Although rationing was in place in the post-war years in Northern Ireland, jobs for men and women were plentiful in East Belfast, and for many, life was sweet. The first day that I started, uh, they took me and I had to get fitted out with a white overall, white cap. Um, then they took me round into what was called the chocolate room then. Whenever we walked through this great big factory, it was massive to me as a wee girl then, you know. And uh, they took me round and I started in what was called the chocolate room then. Uh, putting the dry biscuits through a chocolate conveyor. And then they went along through a cooler and the girls at the other end packed them. Uh, it took you a while to get your speed up, you know, but it was very interesting, you know. So what was that like? I mean, what, what was it like working with all that chocolate and all? Well, at first, uh, you know, you, you wanted to eat some. <laughs> because it was after the ration in those years, you know, you didn't get so much sweet stuff. But you were allowed to have a nibble in that, you know. And uh, it was uh, the girls, they, they made you very welcome. The biscuits, I think, that most people remembered about Inglis's were the marshmallows, chocolate Bellevue, and gypsy creams, and fruit and nut bars. And um, they were fantastic. And come the weekends, you, I think it was a shilling, you paid and you got a pack of mixed biscuits. And then it was a wee bit more than that, a couple of coppers just, um, and you could get a a, a bag of chocolate ones. Then sometimes you could just get a bag of broken ones. But it was nice coming home on a Friday night with them to, to the house where, you know, things like that were like a luxury. We worked our way up. They put you on the different lines and then we went on to the assorted packing, which was uh, eight pound tins of uh, biscuits with all different, you had 15 different biscuits in it and there was liners and you had to make a pattern with all these biscuits and you got two old pence for each eight pound tin. You had to make your own wages then. And it was the best thing that ever happened for after about a month, maybe six weeks, I was coming out with about 12 pound instead of the two pound seven and sixpence. So that, I mean, that was quite big money It then. was big money. My mother said my pay used to keep the house and uh, Oh, well, it done a lot. It, you know, it done a lot for my mother and for myself too. Watching the biscuits was fascinating. Um, the way they come through and, you know, how it was done. So I was always interested in what was going on in the factory. But one day, oh dear, I just happened to glimpse the man who worked on the, on the uh, custard creams. And he climbed up the, this big container, it was sort of that shape, and the custard cream went in through that and down through onto the biscuits. Then another biscuit went on top, but the, they must have uh, run out of the custard. And I saw him climb up with a bucket, and he just put his arm in like this. And he was going out of the bucket and into this machine and he had black, hairy arms right up to here. <laughs> and I thought, oh no. So I've never eaten custard cream since then. And obviously the, the, the biscuits then were exported where, all over the UK? Or? All over, all over. We'd done them for down south, and uh, 
I remember some of the girls, they used to put their name and address in whenever they went to the Navy. They packed Navy biscuits, which was a hard, hard biscuit. And they went out to the ships, the sailors. And some of the girls used to put their name and address. We had no phones then, you know, to see if they could get a boy. <laughs> I wasn't one of them. <laughs> I'd go back to the 50s tomorrow. <laughs> the wonder, most wonderful years of my life, honestly. And I got married in 1959. But from 1950, you learned to dance. You went to the dances. You met different people from all walks of life. There was no politics mentioned, nothing. Nothing about religion. We all went out together, worked hard and played hard, you know. I think we had a good life. Um, as teenagers, because we were never bored, never bored. There was, you know, you had your, your job during the day and if you were fed up with that, you always had the night to look forward to. You went to the pictures. There was great films on in those days that, that you know. Or you went, that maybe your office or the, the short and hands used to have a club in Olmo Avenue. And they would would have more or less dances going, you know, maybe once every three months, and you'd all go to them. Went swimming in the baths every Thursday night, and that was either in Templemore Avenue or Ormore Avenue. And uh, and then afterwards you'd go to Sherry's or somewhere for a cup of coffee and a roll or something like that. So really, in some ways, it was quite a cosmopolitan life. Then. It was, yes, it was indeed. There was a wee dance hall called the Hut in Chamberlain Street, and I was in it five nights out of seven. And we went there the five nights. Then at the weekend, there was the plaza, and you went to the plaza on a Saturday night. It was a massive big ballroom. And then on a Wednesday night, you went to the fiesta, and all the girls, whenever you went into the fiesta, you saw half of England was there. Whenever they go, all got dressed up for we were walking about, we were all like we snow women and snowmen, everybody was in white. But whenever they get dressed up, you know, in their good clothes, you know, but to sort of take a step back and look at each other, you know, at first. But then we all get you. We had great times, great times. So, I mean, you were literally out five or six nights a week then? Yes, uh huh. Even though I worked eight o'clock, two nights, rushed home, got out, went over to the plaza. And it was on day 11, you see, you were there for nine o'clock. Quick wash and quick change and make up on and away you went. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what was there there? What sort of refreshments were there? Was there drink there or? Oh, no. Well, there was, uh, you, there was a tea bar and you could have bought, there was no Coca-Cola in those days. Uh, orange. Orange was the drink then. And then later on, as the years, two or three years down the line, they brought Coca-Cola in. Whenever the American Navy and that kind of, you know, the cook came with them. <laughs> do you remember them as innocent times, or how do you remember those very times? Very innocent times, very innocent. You know, because whenever I look around me now, uh, even my own grandchildren, you know, they'll say, we're going away for the weekend, uh, to hen night. It's maybe over to Birmingham or Liverpool or whatever. We had to be in by 11 o'clock. You weren't allowed. You know, you had to go home, your father would have been standing at the corner waiting on you. But now it's just, I don't know, all, all the innocence has been taken away. You went to Victoria Park, uh, Victoria Park to get there, there was no bypass. It was just uh, the road to the, to the shipyard. Uh, there was wooden steps down to this road. It may have called it Victoria Road, I'm not sure, I can't remember now. But it took you to Victoria Park. That was it. It didn't go any further. But you went in there and you had a picnic. I remember many of the time getting bikes when I was old enough to ride a, a bike and get down there. You spent your whole Saturday down there. It was like going to Mallorca. <laughs> Maybe today, you know, you took a picnic with you. It was brilliant. And what about holidays in those days? Oh, holidays we had for wee holidays, but... Where, what sort of places did you go? Malayl. <laughs> Malayl, Danica, Day and Bangor. 
as all we could afford sort of style, you know. It was just a, a train trip down or a bus down to my well, little banger. Where did you stay in the bed and breakfast then, or where did you stay? Well, m m my brother moved down there, and w w went out down and stayed with him there, or what about booked until we board in the house or something like that, you know. Toured about, banger, done a good day, my little. He went down for cockles. Used to run out to the sea and get the cockles for. Uh, a, 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 a bag, maybe a mate or whoever was with you when I went along and re raped and you know, got cockles and brought them home and boy, oh, they were gorgeous. And Willicks, they called them Willicks. People wouldn't know what I'm talking about when they say Willicks. And they got them Willicks and you know, brought them home and they were alive. And there, there were wee black things with a, a wee... Like wee snails? A wee snail in it. We have a we cover over it, and you had, you had, you had to put them in a, a, in a pot and boil them. And once you boiled them, I'd kill the, the snail, and I brought them out. And to get them out, you had to get a wee pen and to hook it out, and eat it. And it came out about that length. And some were big ones, and some were wee ones, and they were tasty and they were beautiful. And, yeah, and they were for nothing. You just caught, scooped them up. Yes. And that's all people done in them days. Cockles, and the cockles, you got them and you boiled them. And once they boiled, they opened. And they were a beautiful taste. And you had to took them out and opened them all up and ate the cockle. What was in the, was They were marvellous to do, you know. And we enjoyed every minute of it. No, we, we had some fun. We used to knock doors and run away and kick back doors and tie milk bottles to to people's letter boxes and knock a door and them and open the door, obviously the milk bottle smashed, you know. Um, just the girls, I suppose, like any young guys did, but it was more, you know, the guys were playing together, you know. Used to love playing football. We had, where I lived in Redcliffe Parade, there was uh, very close to the, the Oval football ground. And uh, we used to play in a place called the Backer. We, that's all we called it, was the Backer. It was uh, behind Hartness Parade and adjacent to that was the railway line. And we used to, or I did, and many of us did, we used to steal potatoes from our mothers and go around and dig holes around the place in the back after playing football and light a fire and throw the spuds in and burn the spuds and eat them. I remember one time my mother actually said to me, are you taking potatoes out of the house? I said, no, mummy, I wouldn't do anything like that. And she grabbed me by the cuff and pulled me in front of her mirror. My face was pure black. <laughs> so I had to end up, you know, owning up. You walk out of one job into another. It was no problems whatsoever. You never, there was never a reason for anybody not working. And I, between the ages of 14 and 19, I think I had 14 jobs. And the last one I was in for nearly two years. <laughs> so I got around quite a bit um, job wise. Now I feel sorry for the children because uh, 18 and 21 and they still can't get jobs. My only grandson, he's 18 coming in June and he just started work this morning. He's been trained every day from he left school at 16. But thank the Lord, you know, he's got a job today. But uh, as you say, in those days, the jobs were plentiful. And if you didn't like it, if you went in for half an hour or an hour, you didn't like it, you just walked out. But the Halcyon days weren't to last. The decline of the textile industry, along with a falling order book at the shipyard and a lack of demand for the type of engineering that East Belfast had thrived on, saw tens of thousands lose their jobs. I don't know the exact uh, unemployment figures, but when you think of it, the closure, virtual closure for a time of the shipyard, the rope works, Sirocco works, must, all these companies, where did all these people go to? I just, uh, I just can't honestly uh, work out the answer to that question. There was nothing much to take its place, shall we say. The mills and all closed then, you know, there was a, the only court mills and the various bridge road, that was a good place too, that closed. And there was the other one on the Newton Arch Road and that closed, it's just because the shipyard men used to meet the the rope workers and all, we all met, you know, getting home at night and that, you know. All changed. 
People were moving apart from one another then, you know, seemed to be moving away. It's because they had to go other places other to places, get work. Other places, yes, to get work. And then the money was scarcer then too, you know. Every time you turned on the news, it was so many. It was being laid off and paid off and it uh, was terrible. But the people out here, men that did work in the shipyard or at the aircraft factory, we all, the neighbours were very, very good. I just lived around the corner there and our children were all brought up together. If the people next door hadn't their dinner, you shared their, your dinner with them, vice versa. We all helped each other and uh, the children never went without, you know. But uh, there was homes that there was no wage coming into. But at that time, uh, Raymond's work was going bad down at the docks too and they were being laid off. So I went to work in the hospital as a domestic and I worked off and on there for about 12 years, you know, part time. So really between the community pulling together and, and the woman going back out to work, you got through that then? Oh, we did, we did. Uh -huh. uh, there was only one time they, they cut off all the gas and the coal and the electricity, everything came to a standstill, but it only lasted for about a week. And I remember my husband and my son, which is Miller's Lane now, they used to call that the barley field. And him and my son went down and sawed the branches and out of the trees. Got a pile of firewood with no way of cooking. I had a gas cooker, but you couldn't have turned it on in case of an explosion for everything was cut off. So my husband dug a hole in the garden and we took the grids from the cooker, put it out and my pots were black, but the dinners were beautiful. <laughs> it was when it came to the kids and the teenagers and, you know, where, where were they getting jobs? Where, there was nothing. And, and then the, the, the road started changing and this shop closed and that shop closed. Um, there was an abundance of shoe shops at one time. Um, they closed. It wasn't just the factories. Because people didn't have the disposable income. They didn't. They didn't. Um, and then they started knocking streets down and people were moving out and so you've lost the community spirit. As unemployment and the search for work elsewhere saw once tightly knit communities begin to fragment, the last thing people needed was the troubles a sectarian conflict began to flare up in Belfast. What were your memories of the start of the Troubles? Oh, well, it was a bit of a scar in your, in your life, you know. I think it, life had went downhill so quickly. Like, I'm not a politician and I never was interested all that, uh, really, in and that sort of thing. But uh, it certainly hit you very hard to think that people don't know anywhere gun in their pocket. It was awful. You know, we were, we, you were frightened more or less to go out at night. You really were, especially on the Newton Ars Road or anything, anywhere like that. And, um, well, what did you think? I mean, what, what did you, whenever the troubles actually first started, I mean, was there a sense of disbelief or what did people feel about it? They just all more or less kept to themselves in their own districts, their own church groups and whatnot. And is that when, when sectarianism started to creep yes, in? Yes, you, you wouldn't have gone into town or anything like that. And that's when it all started. You know, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant more or less? Where that has never bothered anybody before or during the war, never. It divided the city into enclaves. There were roads you just didn't go up. And there was, I dare say the people who lived on those roads that you wouldn't go up, didn't go up your our, our road either. That's probably where a lot of uh, people became afraid because there was People in organisations coming round, knocking doors, uh, collecting for prisoners, collecting for this, collecting for that. Well, I think then was the start of probably communities starting to break down, or maybe becoming more afraid of opening doors.
I mean, I remember going back again. I mean, you know, I went to school. He came home, my mother was up shopping on the road, door was open, back door was open, front door was open. Nobody closed the front doors until it was night time. All that changed, you know. There was all these romper rooms going on, uh, if you ever heard of that, where they pulled in some of their own boys and beatings and everything else. There was one not far from where I lived. Was there not peer pressure on you to join? There was, yes. I mean, I had a lot of friends who actually joined, and, and maybe two or three of us didn't. But there was a lot of pressure. You know, we were called a lot of names. You know, you were isolated from some of your friends. And then a lot of them who that had got involved and thankfully got out of it before it got beyond. Uh, then sort of, but it was it was bad. It was bad. I mean, some of the fighting and rat and was on the Newton Arch Road. Probably never as bad maybe as some of the other places. But I certainly wouldn't like to go through it again. You know, definitely not. The story of the city of Belfast and how it came to be is really the story of East Belfast because it was in the east that a village became a townland and that townland and the rivers that ran through it gave birth to a mighty industrial engine. It was the engine of East Belfast that was to put the city and Northern Ireland on the map worldwide in terms of industrial innovation and unrivalled engineering skill. Billy McCart didn't become part of Belfast until 1853 in the first revision of the boundary. So at that time it was, as I say, just a, a, a rural... I didn't like school. I, was old. I could have stayed up any time. Although I did well, I was always nervous answering the questions. And I loved it, like, like the school, like the teachers and all, you know. I used to carry on, I used to hold up for carrying on so much, you know. But I enjoyed it. Tell me a bit about community in those days. What was it like living in those wee streets? It was all right, just everybody was in harmony. There was no... Everybody helped one another, you know. And you knew all your neighbours? Yes, my gran lived two doors from us. You started working, um, packing up linen products? Uh, linen products, pill of slips and all that, uh, yeah. And would that, would that have been like an eight-hour day, or what, what was your working day like? Nine o'clock, I think, was the hour we started, and then you worked to, to six. You got an hour for your lunch. And was that not a, a shock to your system, being just 14 years of age? Uh-huh. Was it, were you not very tired? No, I never never felt tired, no. You were glad to be out of school glad and earning money? Glad to be out of school and at, at work, thought it was great working, you know. So what age were you when you left school then? 14, happy enough. And did you know what you wanted to be at that stage, or what you wanted to do? Uh, well, now, that's, that's the only problem. Most people had a good idea what they would have liked to have done. But don't forget, those of it about the name. Townland. And this can be seen on the Williamson map of 1791. Benjamin Edwards' glassworks, which he established in 1776, was one of the early uh, sources of employment. Uh, Later, John Smiley started another glass works to make window glass, specialising window glass. Uh, but this failed before the end of the century, and Edwards took it over. 
and uh, glass works or glass making continued until the uh, 1860s under various owners and the last owner was William Adolphus Ross who became known for his mineral waters. Uh, at Lagan Village was another centre of industry at that period uh, and you can see uh, the earthenware pottery of Victor Coates. He later took over the Lagan foundry on this site he was the uh, he built the first iron ship on the Lagan in 1838, and he went on to become the leading manufacturer of steam engines. So the only other industry shown on Williamson's map is the the new rope walk. Now the, this rope walk uh, closed at a later stage, but rope making remained a, a very uh, prominent industry in East Belfast until late 20th century. The First World War, the first modern war, robbed the nation of not only its finest sons, but of its innocents too. Yet in the maze of narrow streets which made up East Belfast, the mindset remained that of a village, where people relied on one another just to get by. Try and give us a flavour of what life was like in East Belfast in those days. Obviously, a very tight knit community. Oh, I, you knew who lived beside you. Today, I don't think people realise that people living beside them, never mind their name. Oh, you knew who they were, and you knew their uncle Joe and all the rest of it. Like, uh, everybody knew one another, and everybody worked for each other, which was maybe more important. If there was anyone sick, very often you'd have seen somebody running over with a wee plate with maybe a, a cloth over and it was a meal for somebody. You wouldn't see that today. You blame the government for not having that service. Those days the government wasn't thought of. Any time you thought of the government was when the elections were on. 1830s, and if it was a job you went to it. And if you were lucky enough it was your job, the one you wanted, you were but in the meantime, people were looking for a wage. Hunger was a, something that was known, and there was some very hard cases. Was that because of the aftermath of the First World War? I would say it was the aftermath of the First World War. Like it was a depression, depression years. When, when, when you say there was hunger, I mean, did you feel that yourself? That you no, didn't? I didn't feel that because my father had it plots or allotments, whatever, call them whatever you like. And uh, he was industrious that way. And uh, well, we always had a good supply of vegetables. And we were able to hand over some spuds to the people who were maybe having it a wee bit rough. And I, I can remember in around Cromwell Square, five houses and one toilet. Like that's, and it was probably an outside toilet? It was an outside toilet. Oh, <laughs> don't know why they called them privies. <laughs> we need to key up, like. <laughs> I'm sure people nowadays, young people, 